loyal imperial citizens, I'm Chief Librarian Ter Tararek of the Wardens of the Webway chapter. I've been asked by my chapter master to collect the stories of the great heroes of the Imperium and record them for posterity. Our connection with the greater galaxy may have been lost with the fall of Cadia, but we still remain loyal. Some of the greatest legends of the Imperium come from the sons of the God Emperor of Mankind, who fought at his side and unified much of the known galaxy before half fell to the force that now strands us from the embrace of the Imperium. I would be a failure as a son if I didn't first speak of my Jean Sire Jagatai Khan. Despite joining this new chapter of the stranded and forgotten, I am, and forever, will be a white scar. Today we will continue his tale at the Horus Heresy. While the white scars hunted, the Khan's brothers went to war with each other. The Fifth Legion's legend was to grow with the events of the Horus Heresy, when the white scars fought on hundreds of worlds for over seven Terran years against the traitor legions and the other forces of chaos. Unlike many of the other Primarchs, Jagatai never even considered betraying the Emperor for the service of the ruinous powers. Such a course would have been dishonorable in the extreme, since the Emperor had done no wrong to his sons and also because Jagatai so deeply believed in the Emperor's goal of reunifying the entire human race under a single ruler so that it might claim final dominance over the Milky Way galaxy. The White Scars Legion had already been engaged for several standard years on the orders of the Warmaster Horus in a surprisingly punishing campaign against the Orcs of the Condex system where Jagatai had recalled his entire legion when the heresy began. It was at Condex that they first received the news of the Space Wolves Legion's actions during the burning of Prospero. These reports said Russ had turned rebel, and driven by his hatred for Magnus, his legion had utterly decimated the Thousand Suns Legion and their pretty much Magnus had died at the Wolf King's own hand. But due to the effects of the Ruin Storm, a monstrous warp storm unleashed by the word bearers, during the Battle of Kols, astropathic communication was unreliable and vast tracts of the Imperium were made all but impassable. Furthermore, the White Scars fleet astropaths continued to interpret the astropathic messages they received in a contradictory manner. It had begun in the Condex system, right towards the end of the long and brutal Condex campaign, against the Greenskins the first inkling that all was not well in the wider Imperium. There had been no detail then, no authentication, just stray astropathic messages of dubious provenance. It should have been easy to dismiss, to put down to the warping power of the Empyrean. But it had worn on the con, unraveling his sleep. He felt that Imperium was standing upon a precipice. There were also conflicting reports received from the Imperial Fist Legion's Primarch Rogel Dawn that urged the White Scars to return to Terra to help defend the throne world alongside Dawn and Lehman Russ, supposedly now a traitor, as soon as possible. Everything had changed so quickly, garbled in a flurry of contradictory astropathy and secure combusts, Russ of the Space Wolves had gone rogue, or the Warmaster had taking several legions with him, the White Scars were ordered to reinforce the Alpha Legion at the Alexis Nebula, Ferris Manus had killed the Peacock Fulgrim, Mars and the Mechanicum was in open revolt against the Emperor. Some of the warp translated messages bore chronomax from many solar months previously, some had been sent, it seemed, only solar hours previously. Though the Warmaster had ordered the White Scars to bring judgment upon the Space Wolves, the Khan would not unleash his vengeance upon Lehman Russ and his get until he had more detailed information. The Khan had the strength of the Fifth Legion arrayed before him, his order assembled and ready to strike, yet none could tell the Primarch who was the true enemy of the Imperium and all he held dear. Jagatai was next contacted by Lehman Russ himself, 
who had just returned from the burning of Prospero and the assault against the Space Wolf's old rivals, the Thousand Suns Legion. The Vive Legion's fleet had mustered at the Alexis Nebula to lick its wounds after the recent campaign when it was besieged by the forces of the Alpha Legion. Horus had deployed the XXTH Legion to launch a massive assault on Rus, battered and outnumbered space wolves. The Alpha Legion and its twin Primux, Alpharius Omegon, had long harbored deep grudges against the space wolves, and Lehman Rus, in particular, for his criticism of their reliance upon trickery, manipulation, and subterfuge to win battles rather than engaging in what the Space Wolves pretty much saw as honorable, open combat. The Alpha Legion relished the chance to prove their superiority against the arrogant Space Wolves of Fenris by delaying them long enough to keep them from contributing to the Imperial defense of Terra. Although the Khan sympathized with the Space Wolves' predicament, he refused to get involved until he was able to sort out the conflicting and often contradictory astropathic messages he had received. Until he knew, beyond a shadow of doubt, who was an ally and who was an enemy, who had truly betrayed the Emperor and who was still loyal, he refused to choose sides. Wishing his brother the best of luck, Jagatai decided to seek his answers elsewhere. As the White Scars fleet made preparations to depart the Condex system, they encountered a massive Alpha Legion flotilla. The Alpha Legion were an unknown quantity to the White Scars. They did not respond to communication requests and had hung back on the edge of the system, quietly accumulating more warships across a wide sweep of local space. There was no response from the XXTH Legion's command, despite all queries. All White Scars vessels were ordered not to escalate the situation and not to fire upon the interlopers unless fired upon. The warriors of the 5th Legion were to maintain perimeter integrity and not to permit Alpha Legion spacecraft to penetrate within range of the core White Scars fleet. As the Kogan decided on his Legion's next move, the Alpha Legion cordon remained intact, its smooth unity broken only by minor adjustments to the twin defensive lines. Every move that the White Scars made was reflected by Alpha Legion warships in what had become a bizarre game of mirrors. Though the Alpha Legion had presented no threat, these were not the actions of a friend. This could not be denied, but despite that, the Khan still resisted, giving the order to attack. Mere hours earlier, the shape of the reported rebellion within the Imperium had been simple, Russ and his savages had defied orders once more. It had become complex, far more complex. Things were further complicated when the White Scars astropathic choir received official messages directly from Terra, from Rogel Dawn himself the White Scars were commanded to make the swiftest possible passage to the throne world where further instructions and further explanations would be given. The meaning was clear, its origin unambiguous. The Fifth Legion had been ordered to ignore all other claims on their fealty, in particular those of the Warmaster Horus, who had been declared traitor to the Emperor along with any other legion answering his summons. But the Khan was not moved by these demands. He felt the old stirrings of resentment again, the chill anger of the unregarded son and the man who had bent the knee to avoid having domination forced upon him. A price always had to be paid for his inclination to freedom, for skirting along the edges of imperial communication. The reality was that the white scars were always the last to know what was happening in the wider galaxy. The Khan now saw the larger strategic picture, the Alpha Legion did not wish to fight the White Scars, nor did they want to join them. They wanted to cause doubt, keeping the White Scars in the Condex system to tie them up in questions, because they knew the veil was slowly lifting and that messages were only now getting through the ether of the warp. The Sons of Alpharius were manipulators they wanted the White Scars to hear from Dawn. 
They had purposely kept the 5th Legion's fleet at Condex until they could be sure the White Scars had picked up Dawn's message and called for aid. The Alpha Legion, for some unknown reason, wanted the White Scars to return to Terra and aid in its defense from whomever the real traitors were. But the Con would not take direction from anyone, not even from a throne world, that only now that its legions were tearing one another to pieces, deigned to remember that it had his warriors at its service. His white scars were nobody's slaves. They were the Ordu of Jagatai Khan and they took orders from no one else. They would take no one's word for the truth, for they were on their own, just as they had always been, and if there was truth to be found in this, then they would find it for themselves before acting. Jigatai ordered his fleet to prepare for immediate departure from Condex. All across the vast battlefront, White Scar's escort craft moved as one, sweeping towards the encircling Alpha Legion forces in the unified screen. Interfleet communications were shut down and incoming bursts blocked the enemy had had their chance to make themselves understood. Anything that they said now would be disregarded. The White Scars coordinated to perform a standard Zhao, known in Low Gothic as the Chisel, Maneuver Full Fleet, enacted on a single command from the VTH Legion's flagship Swordstorm. Every starship in the service of the Imperium was different. The secrets hidden within their reactor huts were jealously guarded by the lords of the Red Planet and shared with no one outside the privileged circles of the elect. Every pretty much asserted various preferences during construction, Korax had worked obsessively to make his vessels as stealthy as possible, Vulcan to make them durable and Fulgrim to make them beautiful. Primax had ways of circumventing standard imperial command structures they could ban rules, uncover hidden data cores and suborn mechanical magi to their desires. So it was, as the Great Crusade progressed, that each legion fleet slowly took on the character of its master through an endless program of refits, retrofits and base modifications. In the case of the White Scars, only one change had ever been requested of the tech priests and only one metric was ever improved upon speed. The VTH Legion's tech marines spent solar decades boosting reactor power feeds and finding ways to hone maneuverability far beyond the tolerances that each standard starship class had been designed for. The endless pursuit of velocity came with its cost, gunnery captains, had been heard to complain of reduced lance range, and it was well known that a white scars warship would not carry as many troops or dropships as the equivalent vessel in a standard fleet, but such factors carried little weight in a legion drenched in the wild riding tradition of the Chogorian plains. Understanding orders from the Kogan, the legion had never shown off its drive's modified capabilities outside of active war zones. Since so few of the other legions had ever fought alongside the White Scars, this specialization had not become widely known, except for a few speculative reports here and there of strangely elongated engine housings, extravagant thruster formations and oversized fuel lines. It all made for a ferociously fast set of warships, from the largest behemoths to the most slender of system runners. As the White Scars vessels began to move, the Alpha Legion reacted. They maintained the integrity of the cordon, warding the routes to the nearest suitable Mandeville jump points and keeping the White Scars corralled within the vicinity of Condex. As they had done ever since arriving, each ship of the blockade matched the movements of its White Scars counterpart, maintaining a gigantic mirror image across space. The gap between the fleets slowly closed. The Alpha Legion formation reacted, just as a blockade ought to react, maintaining a rigid web across the widest area of space, each node backed up by a second rank of warships held in reserve. Their movements remained cagey, as if they wished to do nothing more than hold the impasse for as long as possible. As the two vanguards closed to within lance range, 
for the first time the white scars notice incoming vox requests from the enemy on the sensorium array and ignored them. The Alpha Legion had already been given every chance to explain themselves. It was then that the Alpha Legion opened fire on its former brothers. All along the front, White Scar's ships probed the line and Alpha Legion ships resisted them. It was a classic containment pattern designed to hem the VTH Legion formation in and prevent isolated warships from running the cordon. The standard breakout response was a full-scale assault on the containment net, aiming to drive it back through a mass volume of concentrated ship-to-ship -ship fire. Such an order was not taken lightly the result would be ruinous for both sides, and only hot hits like Lehman Russ or Omron enjoyed taking such risks. The Alpha Legion clearly judged that the con was not so cavalier. In this, of course, they were entirely correct. The White Scar's vanguard began to drift spinwards, pulling clear of their jump point trajectory and dragging the center of the engagement back towards Condex's gravity well. It looked almost careless, as if aimless commanders had launched a half-hearted breakout without the commitment to see it through. The drift became more pronounced as the intensity of the lost fire picked up. For all that, the individual engagements were muted, probing, restrained. No torpedoes were launched, no gunship wings were unleashed. The two walls of minor warships grappled in a bizarre half-embrace of limited ferocity. All across the engagement zone, VTH Legion positions began to collapse, withering in the face of steady, professional pressure from the enemy. White Scar's vessels dropped formation, protecting their own flanks and leaving holes in the offensive wall. As if fighting a strong headwind out on the Altec back on Cogaris, the vanguard's momentum faltered. When the chronograph reached zero, the White Scar's vessels moved, every one of them, all at the same time, into full attack speed. Everything quickly changed as the VTH Legion's fleet formation morphed in an instant, suddenly switching from an aimless drift pattern into an arrowhead shock assault of astonishing precision. The White Scar's vessels took on new trajectories and moved in perfect concert, suddenly leaping from semi-committed, holding patterns, into a single attack vector. The Alpha Legion most likely had never witnessed such shape mastery. The best Imperial naval officers could not have performed such a maneuver in less than five solar minutes, and it would have required hundreds of course correction warnings and solar hours of preparation to bring off. The White Scars had done it, as one or with no extraneous prompting, in five seconds. The White Scars deployment was now a single spearhead. Escorts shot out, pulling together into a single mass and punching a hole through the enemy cordon. Their sudden bursts of speed and concentrated lance strikes wrong-footed the Alpha Legion vessels in their path, and three Bronze Sprout destroyers were overwhelmed almost immediately, lost amidst a whirlwind of plasma and exploding torpedo trails. More White Scars destroyers screamed through the wreckage, corkscrewing and diving like plunging pots of cetaceans. Everything was aimed at a single point, the flanks were discarded, surrendered to the enemy at every VTH Legion asset in the battlesphere shot into close formation and boomed up to top velocity. The encircling Alpha Legion cordon was now compromised and fractured, its constituents struggling to respond to the lone column of ships that burned its way through their heart. Their capital ships were even slower, unable to take advantage of modified engines or the white scars almost preternaturally skilled shape crews. The swordstorm pulled up to the forefront of the chisel formation, propelled by its monstrous, raging plasma engines and surrounded by a swarm of racing escorts. Bulky vessels of the Alpha Legion second rank tried to bar its path, sliding into a hurried defensive formation, 
with what now looked like ponderous clumsiness. All around their legion flagship, other white scars war ships launched forward facing borages, vomiting lost beams, and plasma bolts and torpedo salvos in a vast, intense column of pure destruction. The chisel had hammered its way through the Alpha Legion cordon, breaking it open at its weakest point. The entire formation tightly knit, long and slender like a throwing javelin, raced out into open space. The Alpha Legion struggled to regroup in its wake, pulling warships from the far-flung cordon formation like an octopus clutching its many limbs back to itself. They had not lost critical numbers of ships, but the sudden attack run had blown their formation wide open and destroyed the cohesion that they had so painstakingly built. The White Scars run did not slow. If anything, free of the need to maintain a barrage of lost fire, it accelerated. As the orb of Condex fell rapidly away aft, it was mediated by the glowing corpses of a dozen Bernal Alpha Legion warships. The storeships of the White Scars fleet soon reached their mandeville points and translated, without delay into warp space, their destination unknown. The White Scars understood that fate was against them. Somehow the warp storms around Condex had been orchestrated by some mysterious outside force. Though it took enormous power, or devices of ancient and unknown origins, it could be done. To seek out the answers they sought, the Kogan ordered his legion to hate for the source, to find the architect of the chaos engulfing the Imperium. Yet, only one soul could see the warp as it truly was, and that was Magnus the Red, the only one of his brothers that Jagatai had ever truly trusted. If Magnus still lived then everything could be salvaged. If he was dead, then the Imperium was finished. The White Scars set course for Prospero. As the Softstorm broke free of the warp on the Prospero system's outer limits, the warship systems were brought online and began to run forward auger sweeps. The results were not encouraging, no Vox signals were detected and there were no transports nor energy trails. A major star system like Prospero ought to have had thousands of ship spores hanging in the void, the chemical residue of void engine release, but the routes inbound from the Mandeville warp point were sterile. Soon the Thousand Suns homeworld swam into extreme forward sensor range. Blurry pig's feet flickered into life, clarifying rapidly as servitors adjusted the image gain logic engines. The planet was entirely dark. Prospero had once been a jewel of a world, a pillow of the color of a Terran dawn, banded with lilac and underlit by glistening ice caps. From space it had been pristine, untouched by the industrial hypersprawl that had turned the throne world of Terra into a great inch ball of rockcrete and iron. Now it was mottled the color of burnt charcoal. Swirls of drifting cloud, as thick and dark as those that swept across Alenor, covered the ravaged planet. As the White Scars fleet moved into orbit, the Kogan instructed the fleet to blockade, then prepare for planet fall. If his ships detected anything with a Fenrisian marker, they were ordered to kill it. By the time Swordstorm reached geostationary orbit over the world's capital city of Tiska, there was no longer room for doubt. Atmospheric readings streamed in, adding to the visual evidence. There was substantial tectonic activity, atmospheric pollution levels were far in excess of mortal tolerances. These markers were indicators of a heavy bombardment consistent with mass drivers from orbit, followed by a secondary trauma. Toxins across a wide spectrum were present in lethal quantities, and extensive volcanism scarred the equatorial zone. Something in the upper atmosphere, an etheric field, a truly massive one was preventing the white scars from sending landers or drop pots. The wool was rapidly dying and the phenomenon was still growing, perhaps as a result of what had happened there. 
One did not kill an entire planet without aftershocks. Undeterred, the con opted to teleport to the surface. But it was made clear that the topographic interference might make it impossible for the flagship to extract the pre much or even make Vox contact. Jagatai and 12 of his Terminator armored bodyguards, the Kashyyyk, teleported down to the unstable surface of Prospero. As the Primarch and his warriors explored the ruined capital city, they observed a scene of devastation stretching away under the darkened sky. The whole city reeked of burning metal. The Khan's armor sensors told him the surfaces around him were still warm from the afterglow of whatever apocalypse had overtaken Prospero. Everything was simply gone, all the libraries, the repositories, the Alcana. If the Space Wolves had truly done this, then perhaps their power did match their boasts. The Khan instructed his warriors to search for the caves that he knew were under the city. They would begin their search for the Crimson King there. Some amongst the Khan's command were a part of the warrior lodges, a close fraternity of warriors that existed outside of the Space Marine Legion's formal structure. It was common knowledge that the Emperor frowned on such institutions, claiming they were dangerously close to the cults of ancient superstition. Despite this, the proliferation of these warrior lodges quickly spread amongst the other legions, even into the White Scars Legion. Many of the Terran warriors of the VTH Legion, as well as some of their erstwhile Chogorian brethren, took part in the clandestine activities of the lodges. They felt that the Kogan was too slow in deciding which side the White Scars should choose in the coming conflict that had only begun to rage amongst the Legion's Astartes. These lodges had already made their choice. The moment had finally come, and so, they moved as one, silently and efficiently. Led by the esteemed Heisek Noin Khan, the Warrior Lodge members declared their allegiance to Horus. They had remained secretly in contact with Horus partisans through arcane means, at least, since the campaign at Condex. In the absence of the Kogan on the surface of Prospero, Heisek Noin Khan was in command of the flagship and, by extension, the VTH Legion's fleet. Personnel began to move between the warships as the Lodge members began to move themselves into position for their coup cool d'etat. Discovering the clandestine activities of Heisek and his co-conspirators, Sherban Khan, commander of the Brotherhood of the Storm, attempted to bring to the attention of Jamulan Noyan Khan that his Ordu commander Heisek was a part of this cancer at the heart of their legion and informed him of their intended plans. Unable or unwilling to assist, Jamulan dismissed these accusations out of hand and ordered Sherban to return back to his ship until he had received further orders. It had been a slim hope Jamulan did not have quite the same reputation as Heisek and had not been with the Legion from the start. As a result, he was not as close to the pre much. Perhaps it had been too much to expect. Back aboard his ship, the Kelgian, Sherban Khan, was unable to sit idly by. He ordered the entirety of his brotherhood to muster and prepare for action. They would seize the initiative and oppose this madness before it could seize hold of their entire legion. On Prospero, it was difficult to witness what had become of Magnus' iridescent city of glass and crystal. The con made his way through the layers of grey-silver dust, watching heavy skies scud across the blackened shells of old structures. The lightning never ceased, flickering away on the northern horizon. The Khan's Kashyyyk of Terminators fanned out around him. They went as warily as he, and their bone-white armor made them look like ghosts in the dark. Jigatai had not wanted to believe it, not truly. His feelings about Lehman Ras had always been mixed respect for the warrior, exasperation at the boss, the self-appointed exceptionalism. It was another thing, though, 
to witness what he had done, to see the truth of the white scar star speakers, astropaths, testimony. The con found that the truth, now that it was before him, was a bitter draught indeed. As the small landing party of warriors made their way deeper into the ruins of the city, they found themselves near the cult temples. As the con investigated the immediate area he heard an unmistakable buzzing noise, like the drone of mass insect wings. Though there were no life signs detected, the con could not shake the feeling that he heard a distinct buzzing sound. The con ordered his warriors to disable their autosensors and to use their own eyes. Bling dismissing the lattice of targeting reticles and environmental compensators hovering in their field of vision within their helmets, only then did the white scar see them shimmering in spectral blue-white, arthropodic, winged and massive. There were dozens, sliding up out of the ground, like unquiet shades, rising from the grave. They were ruined things, twisted and hunched, though still twice the size of the terminators, before them. Once free of the broken earth, they swayed through the air jerkily, lurching as though blind and famished. The con recognized the vile creatures, immediately sanguine, vile warp entities, drawn to the mental emanations of unprotected, badly injured or nascent psychers, whose minds they attack for the obscene purpose of gestating their progeny. These creatures had been a blight on the otherwise benign world of Prospero for centuries, consuming the minds of mortals. The thousand suns had hunted them, driving them into the wilds and far from the glittering spice. Now, like everything else, they had been reduced to ghost remnants of the living horrors they had been. Only, unlike all the other destroyed fauna, they had retained some vestige of their old wills. The white scars quickly found that their physical weapons had no effect on the spectral insects, their blades passing through their arthropedal forms harmlessly. Their only advantage was that the creatures were blind, yet they could still sense their prey. When the Sangunan struck, they angled their swollen abdomens to sting. The glowing tips of their long proboscis passed through the Terminator's ceramite with ease. House of Agony filled the air as lumpy matter was sucked up the creature's translucent proboscis. Unable to fight such fell creatures, the Kogan ordered his warriors to fall back. As Jagatai fought the hideous creatures, the ground beneath his feet gave way, the flagstones damaged by the space wolf's relentless orbital bombardment. Falling for a long distance, the Primarch came to a sudden halt. Buried up to his chest in the fallen debris, the Khan attempted to contact his Kashyyyk on the surface. He received nothing but static for his trouble. Pulling himself free from the power of rubble, Jagatai found himself in a strange underground world of sinkholes and chasms that might open up into something bigger. He had come looking for caves. And he had found them. The Kashi master Chin Xe ordered his warriors to withdraw, for they could not fight this new threat. Staggering away from the creatures, the other warriors did not respond immediately. Despite their fearsome levels of discipline, leaving the site of the Kogan's fall was anathema. They searched back across the heaving terrain, lumbering away from the sanguine attacks as best they could, trying to reach the crumbling maw of the fissure that had swallowed their primarch. It was a doomed attempt. The Kashi pulled together and retreated towards a bombed-out terrace. The Sanguine came after them. Soon the surviving Kashi found themselves trapped, and so they formed a broken line, determined to face the enemy. Then suddenly, they all felt the static build-up of enormous power. A second later the entire chamber was filled with light as flames leapt up from underneath the Sanguine. Caught up in the maelstrom of blazing, purple-tinged fire, the creatures simply burst apart. Turning to investigate the source of the flames, Chin Xai 
felt a fresh surge of power just behind him. His arms went rigid, locked by some mysterious force. A huge weight pressed against his twin heart, slowing him down and deadening his movements. A bolter was pressed against his chest and a figure stood before him in crimson armor. His faceplate was that of a suit of gold-crested Mark III power armor, archaic and festooned with Thousand Suns iconography. He introduced himself as Reveal Alvida, a sergeant of the Thousand Suns Legion's fourth fellowship and a member of its Covidi cult. He was the last surviving member of his squad. He led the Kashyyyk away from the danger of the ravenous warp-spawn insects. Alvida led the surviving Kashyyyk far through the empty city, until they found themselves within the ruins of a grand audience chamber. The White Scars inquired as to how the Thousand Sun Sergeant had come to be on Prospero and how long he had been there. Alvida informed them that he had arrived on Prospero after its destruction, and that he could give them no answers as to what had previously occurred. As for how long he had been there, he did not know, for his power armor's internal chronometer had been blown in battle. He understood that the White Scars were trying to find their missing pretty much, but their efforts were futile. Their gene sire could fight the Sagnuian, for he was made to fight them. They needed to get away from the benighted planet, and that when they did, to take him with them. Chin Xe explained that they would make one more final attempt to find their primarch. Alvida acquiesced to their wishes, but requested that they wait for a short time until he had fully recovered from his last encounter with the Valwarp entities. They would need his psychic abilities if they wanted to survive the coming conflict. Jagatai Khan made his way through the newly discovered tunnels. He had only been able to go down, despite several attempts to find a route back to the surface. The Sangyuan had not followed him down, but the absence of any movement beyond his own was chilling. Eventually, he made his way to a large chamber. The space was immense, and the upper reaches soared away into the darkness. The walls curved upwards steeply, terrace like an auditorium and striated with bands of metallic ore. Brass instruments lay about it, each one smashed or warped. There were bodies buried beneath the ash and metal, human bodies, mortal in stature. The Kashi master had been right there was nothing left on Prospero. The Khan had been a fool to come, and a greater fool to come down to the surface in person. As he stared grimly at the macabre surroundings around him, he suddenly felt a restless, gentle movement in the dust. A ghostly outline of a figure flickered, burning coldly. He stood a little taller than the con, just as he had done in life. His face was the same, though the expression was infinitely weary and a little distracted. His lone eye did not focus in the past, its focus had been remorseless. Holding his ground, the con stood speechless, still gripping his blade. His defensive posture was unnecessary. When the figure spoke, the voice dispelled any trace of doubt. It was an apparition of his missing brother, Magnus the Red, the Crimson King. At first the con did not believe the evidence of his senses for a long time. The shade explained that it was merely a remnant or psychic fragment of Magnus a dream of something destroyed. Though the con had doubts that it truly was his brother, the Magnus fragment explained that it was not the Crimson King at least not entirely, but they did share a soul. The shade explained to the con what had occurred recently on the devastated world, that it was their father's vengeance for his hubris, for daring to break the Emperor's edicts. Magnus confessed that Jagatai had been right, he should have restrained his sons in their explorations of the power of sorcery. However, Magnus added that the Khan had never had to make the bargains he had subscribed to, and the VTH Legion 
had never been compromised by the warp as the Thousand Suns had been to ensure their survival against the threat of constant mutation. But the truth of the matter was that everyone in the Imperium had been deceived. The Great Ocean was never benign, and it was conspiring against mankind even as they stepped into its shallows. The greater the soul, the greater the jeopardy. Horus was the greatest soul of them all, and so his was the furthest fall. Horus had been eaten by the warp. His body was bursting with it, corroding him, gnawing at him, from the inside. There were others first chaplain Erebus, their brother logger of the word bearers, but it was always every mortal's decision in the end, whether to reject or embrace the corrupt promises of the Empyrean. Magnus had tried to warn the Emperor. That was his crime, and the destruction of his legion and his homeworld was his punishment. It was pride that was all. Pride that had swallowed Horus as well. The ruinous powers waited and they watched, and they realized what the Primax had not that only the Primax could destroy the Primax. Only they could bring down the Eternal Imperium, because everything else had been annihilated. That's what Logger called the Chaos Gods, the Primordial Annihilator. Most of the Primax, without realizing it, had already cast their lots in the great drama about to unfold, and only a few remained. They were being lined up, one by one, to tear at each other's throats. The Khan was one of the last. The Chaos Gods did not know which way the White Scars would go. None of them did, and that was why the White Scars had the eyes of the galaxy on them at last. Jagatai Khan had never taken sides. He would take everyone on if he had to. But the Shade of Magnus explained that there were but two paths to choose from he could hunker down in what remained of their father's imperium and try to keep Horus from beating down the door, or he could choose to remember how Horus had once been and stand at his side as he brought terror to the complacent. The first would be the more loyal course, but the other had its merits. When Jagatai pressed Magnus for where his allegiances lay, the Shade explained that his choices were constrained. He now knew more than anyone what awaited those on the other side. It turned out to be the ruin the Crimson King had worked for centuries to avoid, but their father was not the forgiving sort. Magnus had burned his bridges with the Emperor. They were burned when he had broken the wards over the Emperor's secret webway project after he had projected his astral form into the dungeons of the Imperial Palace to bring his father the dire warning of the corruption of Horus and his intentions for insurrection. Khan did not quite believe that the apparition that now stood before him was truly his brother. The Kogan had come to Prozapo to find a friend. Whatever else had happened, he thought he could come to Magnus for his counsel. Despite all this, Magnus still wanted to know whose side Jagatai would choose. Jagatai was ambiguous about his choice, for he believed that Horus was corrupted and that the Emperor was a tyrant. The Khan informed him that he could choose neither. But Magnus explained it did not work like this. Sooner or later, the Khan would have to choose between the two sides, and that the next time they met they would either be allies or enemies. Jagatai still had a choice, and Magnus implored his brother to make the right one. Jagatai expressed his regret at not being there at the Council of Nikkei, besides both Magnus and Sanguinius. The Khan explained that their brother Horus had purposely sent him away, for there were no accidents. But Magnus dismissed his misgiving, telling him instead to focus on the future. Jagatai snapped at the ether shade that there was no future. Khan and his brothers had all been working for something better than this. Magnus countered that this was certainly true of Robot Gilliman and perhaps Logger as well, in his own warped way. 
But Jagatai had not he had only been a part of the great crusade, for the hunt. Jagatai countered that the Hun had kept his legion pure. Magnus argued that it had kept his brother away. He had been so easy to keep out of the conversation. The Crimson King had been there the whole time he just did not hear the words being sibilantly whispered by the powers of the warp. The Magnus apparition explained that it was glad that the Con had come to see him they had always seen eye to eye. Though he thought Jagatai was brittle, at least he always spoke the truth. When they finally concluded their conversation, the Con informed Magnus that he had got what he had come for. He told Magnus that he had always been his friend. Magnus understood and looked at the Con for a moment. Jagatai knew what he had to do. With a final parting word, Jagatai swung his great blade at Dao and struck Magnus' outline, and the ghost shell shattered, spilling a thousand pieces like broken glass. The con remained still. He felt as though moving, even by a fraction, might break what remained. Around him, the reflecting caves sighed with emptiness, their majesty in tatters. The con bowed his head. At least, amidst all the numbness, the truth was now known. The choice could be made, for the traitor had been unmasked. Duty could now be done, the call to war could be given. But, for all that, still he could not stir. The dream had died. As Sherban Khan secretly prepared his brotherhood to storm the 5th Legion's flagship, the Terran commander Togan Khan warned Heisek Noen Khan that their plan to suborn Shiban's loyalty to their cause had failed. Togan informed him that the Brotherhood of the Storm's Con had been to see Jemulan Noen Khan. Things were now moving very quickly. Heisek had the Sword Storm and Togan Khan would take the Chinza. As long as the Warrior Lodge brothers held onto the capital ships, the others would fall into line. When the Kogan returned, he would see the wisdom of the actions of the Lodge brothers. Horus and Jagatai had always seen things the same way. What could the Khan do if his fleet was of one mind? He would recognize what they had done and see the justice in it. Togan, like many of his erstwhile Lodge brothers, had made their choice a long time ago, years back when the first stirrings of the Lodges had come to their ears. It was the chance to mold the White Scars Legion into what it should have been a shock attack force to rival the vaunted spear tip of the Sons of Horus, only shackled to a greater, more generous mind than that of the mighty Khan. This was the destiny of the Fifth Legion. All the Lodges had done was help the process along. Suddenly, every Warrior Lodge member within the Fifth Legion received a relayed algorithm from the Sword Storm. They rejoiced, for they had called, and Horus had answered. Looking at the signals, still on the edge of the system, but already moving in close tree, then four vessels allied to Horus were moving towards the Prospero system. Meanwhile, Sherban Khan had his ship, the Caligian, slide close to his legion's flagship. When they were in position, he led his brotherhood in a daring orbital assault by launching specially modified sojitsu pattern void bikes. They were more like one-man fighters than jet bikes, and an armor-sealed white scars legionary could use them for short bursts in the void just as other legions used their land speeders for atmospheric work. As Sherban and his men launched a lightning assault upon the massive flagship, the Sword Storm's weapon batteries buffeted them in a flurry of lost fire. As they pushed their bikes close to the flagship, scanning for an entry point, the Con finally saw a single docking port, unshielded and unbarred. Leading the way, Shaban and his warriors tore through the oncoming lost fire, jerking and ducking to avoid the beams, sweeping past a whole row of angled torpedo launchers and streaking towards the signal port. K-1 
kicking the retros at the last moment, the Void bike skidded around in zero gravity, then powered into the salt storm's inertia bubble. Their bike's graph plates wind instantly, adjusting to the rapidly moving environment, before locking on the docking bay floor and righting themselves. The Brotherhood of the Storm followed their commander into the corridors beyond. Heisek Noen Khan and his co-conspirators had been blindsided by Sherban Khan's daring assault. Reports streamed in there was disorder on many vessels now, as both factions vied for control of their respective vessels. Heisek ordered a voxling to be open with the flotilla, and to prevent any of their vessels from opening fire on them. This was their moment, they would hold their position. Turning to the dozens of white scars around him there were cons, captains, senior ship officers and mortal commanders, just a few of those who had been persuaded and who were now working to free the legion from the hand of tyranny in service to Horus. They would remain resolute. They had no choice. Suddenly, the bridge detected signs of a boarding party making their way towards the bridge. Heisek gave the order to repel borders. A lone white scars brotherhood posed no real risk, they had run the calculations. But still, he had hoped to avoid full-scale combat with his battle brothers in persuading others to the honorable cause. Perhaps that had always been a foolish hope. The Noyankon did not understand why the flotilla of newly arrived traitor vessels did not make contact. Why the silence? He assured his warriors that this was the test. This is what they had been working towards. It could not be halted now. For the sake of the Imperium, no backward step. As Sherban led his brotherhood further into the interior of the White Scar's flagship, he encountered resistance from a rival brotherhood, commanded by his former comrade, the Terran commander Togan Khan. Halfway up a staircase, on a colonnaded landing area, a line of White Scars waited. The Brotherhood of the Moon was well established, already crouched in fire positions and able to shelter behind the curve of the pillars around them. Beyond lay the approaches to the strategium and bridge. Togan attempted to reason with his erstwhile brothers. He informed Sherban and his men that the bridge was sealed. Sherban inquired as to the whereabouts of the Kogan. Togan calmly replied that Heisek Noen Khan spoke for the Kogan. Sherban felt his blood run hot. No one, not even the Emperor himself, spoke for the Great Khan. Undeterred, the Brotherhood of the Storm burst out of cover and searched up the stairway, charging into the incoming torrent of bolt shells as the hall exploded with light, sound and fury. The Loyalist Brotherhood of the Storm surged up against the hammering deluge, sprinting in loose formation. For every one knocked back, ten more gained ground. Brother locked blades with brother, and the echoing din of bolter fire was joined by the accurate snarl of energy weapons. The loyalist white scars fought in a flurry of vicious strokes, wrenching their blades deep into the flesh of their enemies. If the enemy had been green skins, they would have kept going carving into the organs, making sure but these were their brothers. They had no wish to kill, if it could be avoided, they immobilized, shattered bones, throttled and bludgeoned, then moved on, sprinting further up through the throng of warriors. The fighting was bizarre close-pack, confused and brutal, but strangely detached. No fighters hooped or cried out in battle cant. They fought with cold discipline, going through the movements with consummate skill, but taking no joy in it. It was poor fighting, cramped and bitter. None of them let loose with the flamboyance that they were used to. Sherban urged his brothers onwards, trying to instill the virtues of greater speed, greater power. Togan did the same exhorting those about him into a typically dogged defense. Neither side relished the carnage. 
Shiban's forces pushed up through the narrowing space, gaining ground with every surge. Many fell to the concentrated volleys of covering fire, their armor pulverized in the withering barrage, but their momentum was not halted. Togan's forces had lost too many warriors to hold the ground, and soon struggled to keep them back. Just as the arch of the observation deck sought away ahead of Sherban and his forces, Togan had his forces fall back in mass. They all went quickly, decisively, as if the move had been long planned. Shiban's instinct was to charge after them, cutting them down as they broke. All around him his brothers did the same, sprinting ahead to run the enemy down. That was when Sherban realized they had been drawn into a trap. Skidding to a halt, Sherban crouched down, just as the hurricane hit. From high up on the terraces on either side of the bridge, many meters up between the pillars and suspended platforms, massed bolt of fire tore up the floor in a cloud of debris. Many of Sheban's warriors were caught in the conflagration and were ripped apart by the hail of bolt of fire. The rest of them retreated to what cover they could. Just as they did so, the wave of bolt of fire ceased. Scanning ahead, Sherban observed that Togan's warriors had hunkered down in a long line across the servitor pits, bisecting the hall. Dozens of sharpshooters were stationed above them on the terraces, holding fire for now, but still primed. Beyond that, he saw more heavy infantry holding position around the epicenter of the bridge itself, the command throne. Hasek's own Kushik were amongst them, hulking in Terminator battle plate. Other defending white scars occupied strategic points in the observation deck beyond. The bridge was covered, locked down, utterly secure. Hasek Noemkon stood stoically, addressing the crouching intruders, trying to get them to stand down. Meanwhile, the four incoming traitor warships drifted closer, utterly incautious, prowling through local space as though they owned it. Up close, their fleet markings were now easily identifiable they were 14th Legion, the Death Guard, not warships from the Sons of Horus. More traitor starships soon entered the system. Two of them burned through the outer system at high speed. No markers, no items marked them, just subwarp signatures and the telltale flicker of void shield activation. The White Scar's fleet was paralyzed. Their ships were not moving to counter either threat closing in on them. The Legion had turned upon itself as the hidden divisions were suddenly exposed everywhere at once. Hasek explained that the Kogan would return. He and his men were not traitors, it would all be resolved. The stakes were too high to leave things hanging unresolved, the invaders were going to charge again. This time it would not stop, not until only one faction remained on the bridge, traitor or loyalist, whichever was which. As Sherban ordered his men to prepare to engage the enemy, a deafening roar suddenly boomed through the entire bridge. The blinding iridescence of a teleportation beam burned brightly for a few moments. When it finally cleared, the scene on the bridge looked entirely different. Now a hundred more white scars legionaries stood arrayed in ranks across the outer circle of the bridge, all aiming their bolters at the command throne. Jemulan Noyenkon stood at the forefront in his master-crafted Terminator battleplate, with his retinue of veterans at his back. He ordered Hasek to stand down, as the attempt to alter the 5th Legion's path had failed. The tension hung heavily, like a thunderhead about to break. A command was given, issued from the vox grill of one of the commanders. Shiban's elation at Jemulan's entrance had been short-lived. The forces were even now, each carrying devastating amounts of firepower. Every stage of the escalation had brought the ruin of the 5th Legion closer weapons 
that had been made to turn upon enemies, were now opening up at one another. Shaban leapt from cover and beckoned his warriors into the fray. Legionary fought legionary, full-blooded and committed. The mortal crew of the flagship, unable to do anything in the face of such unleashed fury, cowered behind what defences they could find. All but one a grey-haired woman, wearing a rumpled and torn Imperial Army General's uniform. She ran straight towards Shaban as he charged the servitor pits, her arms waving frantically. Something in her eyes stopped him she was not desperate to survive but to get his attention. She informed Sherban that she had the Coggan's locus. She ordered Sherban to get her to the teleport platform. The frail woman explained to him that it was she that had opened the docking bay doors. She had a positive lock on the missing pre-march, and if Sherban did not want to watch his legion destroy itself, then he would get her to the teleporter controls. Chin Aksei and the surviving Kashyyyk made their way back towards the central part of the ruined city of Tiskaya, where their pre-march had been swallowed up by the massive hole in the center of a ruined square. As they approached their designated goal, they could hear the first trace of buzzing. Sangnuin materialized over the legionaries, coalescing instantly as if sucked from the atmosphere itself. The Kashyyyk prepared to face the ghostly insects, knowing full well their weapons were useless against the warp spawn creatures. Then the Thousand Sun Sergeant Alvida cried out as he conjured lightning that slammed into the insectoid bodies of the creatures. The glowing exoskeleton of one of the creatures hardened, solidifying like freezing ice, allowing Chin Xe to strike the vile creature with his power sword. Positioned in the center of the Kashyyyk, Alvida continued to unleash bolts of warp fire into the foul insectoids. When the bolts hit, the half-corporeal creatures crystallized into physicality. Once in this state, the white scars could take them on. Soon more of the creatures materialized, first a few, then dozens. Even stranger creatures emerged among them, giant scarabs, towering mantids, and vespid-like beasts. Alvida worked hard, throwing bolt after bolt at the emerging horrors. The white scars kept fighting, hacking their way towards their intended goal. But the numbers began to tell. The spectres kept materializing, bursting into ghoulish life from all directions, spilling out of the air. Alvida worked frantically, lighting up the skies with his sorcery, but it was not quick enough. Still there was no signal, no location reading for the con. As the creatures began to overwhelm the legionaries, pressing in from all sides, Chin Xe wrote the con's name defiantly as he prepared to meet his death with both eyes open. Suddenly, one of the creatures blasted apart, spinning into a thousand fragments that sailed high across the ruins. A tall figure stood on the far side of the annihilated phantasms. His sword glowed with etheric residue, as though deep in molten iron. For a second, lost in shock, Chin Xe just stared at the newcomer, breathing heavily. Then the armored figure spoke, and all became clear. It was the Kogan. The premarch of the white scars strode forth after the retreating horrors, his long Dao power blade shimmering. Killing the creatures was straightforward enough. It was a matter of belief, as much as anything, attuning himself to the potential that existed within him, just as it did in all of his premarch brothers. They were, every one of them, creatures of the warp, whatever Malkador the Sigilite told the masses. The warp ran through the minds of the Primarchs like blood in a vein. Chin Xe and his surviving Kashyyyk warriors gathered around the Kogan. He inquired whether they had a fix on the sword storm. The Kashyyyk master replied that unfortunately they did not. The Khan turned back, 
and caught sight of the Thousand Suns legionary, among the others. For a terrible moment he thought it was Oriman for he wore the same crimson armor and bore the same arcane sigils. After Arvida introduced himself, the Khan regarded him closely. He could see the vigor of the psychic soul glowing inside the thousand sun astatis like a candle flame. His warriors inquired of their jin sire whether or not he had found the answers he was looking for. Jigatai thought for a moment about that, for he did not know what to say. He replied that he now knew more than he had before they came to Prospero, and that everything they had been told was the truth. Prospero did indeed bear the kumak of Lehman Russ, just as they had been told, but Magnus had already fallen, just as they were also told. Behind them all stood Horus, the lord of Primax. They were all to blame there was no single traitor there was only a web, stretching back in time, clutching at them all. And now it came for them. As the clouds above them began to glow, a vibrant shard of light speared down from the smoke, crackling as it hit the stone below. The Terminators turned to face it, powering up their weapons. Chin Xa stepped in front of the Khan. Jagatai told his warriors he had felt this new arrival's presence following them for a long time. He had been on the Khan's heels since Alenor. At long last, he had finally caught up. The Kashyyyk moved into a loose semicircle, poised to strike. None of them would move before the order was given, though they were the extension of the Khan's will. The Khan ordered his warriors to stand down, for the stranger was beyond all of them. How could he not be? For he was his brother Mortarion, the Death Lord, pretty much of the Death Guard Legion. Watching the ash settle and the residual snacks of Etherburn ripple into nothing, seven figures within the maelstrom emerged. Six of them were legionaries. They were clad in pale, thick slab terminator armor and carried huge power sites known as man reapers. Their pauldrons were olive green and the links between the plates were coal iron. They were massive, heavier set than Chin Xa's retinue, hunched at the shoulder and leaking pale green vapor from the last of the teleportation beams. These were members of Mortarion's elite bodyguard, the Death Shroud. The seventh figure, occupied a different order of power. He towered over his fellows, clad in battle plate of bare brass and corpse white ceramite. A long cloak of dark green hung down from hiring shoulder guards. Skulls dangled from chains around his belt, some human, some xenos. A long pistol nestled among them drum barreled and studded with bronze cumacus. His eyes were amber, glinting from under the deep shadow of a tattered cowl. An ornate rebreather covered the lower half of his face. Coils of oily gas spilled from the lining of his battle plate, dribbling down the skull-painted surfaces and hissing on contact with Prospero's death-dry soil. Mortarion planted the heel of his enormous sight into the dust. The con looked up at the blade. It was known as Silence, the greatest of the 11 5th Legion's infamous Man Reapers. Mortarion proceeded to explain the reason for his recent arrival. He told Jagatai that he had sought him out, for things had changed. Jagatai realized that his brother had come to persuade him to join the traitor's cause. The Khan observed him guardedly, for Mortarion had always been hard to read. He left his blade unsheathed, holding it loosely at his side. Observing the physical changes in his brother, he noticed that Mortarion's power seemed to have grown. Something burned in him, dark like old embers. His flesh was somehow bleaker, his stance a little more crabbed, and yet the aura of intimidation around him had been augmented. Back on Alenor, even at the height of triumph, he had not possessed quite the same heft. 
Jagatai commanded his brother to say what he had come to the ruins of Prospero, to say. The Khan correctly surmised that Horus had not sent Mortarion, he had come of his own accord, with his own agenda. Mortarion brushed off the Khan's reasoning, but Jagatai pressed him. The Death Guard pretty much attempted to sway the Khan to Horus' cause, to imagine for himself a galaxy of warriors, of hunters, where the strong were given their freedom to act as they would, unbound by the Emperor's demands. The Khan was no fool, and of course this new galaxy would be led by Horus. Mortarion merely shrugged Horus would be the start of the new order. He was the champion, the sacrificial king. He might burn himself out to get to Terra, he might not. Either way, there would be room for others to rise to power over the galaxy to come. Mortarion told his brother that he should not have thrown in his lot with the Sanguinius, let alone Magnus. He hated to see the three of them getting dragged in deeper by the Emperor's hypocrisy. Their father had tried to pretend that it was not there, the warp, as if he were not already up to his elbows in its soul-sucking filth. In Mortarion's opinion it should have been cordoned off, put away, forgotten about. But the Khan was not fooled by his brother's sincerity. He had seen what had happened. The Death Lord had never hidden what he wanted. Jagatai could see how his brother thought it would all play out, first hobbled the sorcerers. Silence the witches. Drive them out, and rule would pass to the uncorrupted, the healthy. This was Mortarin's great project. He had even told the con on Alenor. The con had thought back then that they were empty threats, but he should have known better. Mortarion did not make empty threats. But it had all gone wrong. Though Mortarion had completed his great mission and the Emperor had handed down the edicts of Nikkei, forbidding the use of sorcery and the disbandment of the Legion's librarius, there were now more sorcerers than ever amongst the ranks of the traitors. Horus had sponsored them, and Logger had shown them new tricks. If Magnus had not already made up his mind on which side of the conflict he would be on, then he soon would, and then Mortarion would be surrounded. He had destroyed the libraries of the legions only to find witches were now untrammeled amongst the traitors. The Khan had seen the overall picture perfectly. Magnus had shown him. Jagatai warned his brother that though his legion might be free of the warp's corruption for now, the change would come, for Mortarion had made his pacts with the masters of the Empyrean, and now they would come to collect. But the Death Lord explained that this was why Mortarion had come to find Jagatai. Mortarion had run out of friends. Who would stand with him against the Aetherweavers now? Most assuredly not their brother Ongron, nor the half-mad Conrad Curse. The con gazed at Mortarion disdainfully as he made his complaints. His brother had tasted the fruits of treachery and found them bitter. The con did not wish to be dragged into his brother's ruin Mortarion was on his own. Struggling to contain his anger at this response, Mortarion warned the con that he had come to give his brother a choice half of the White Scars Legion had already declared for Horus, and the others would follow wherever the Kogan ordered them. Their father's time was over the Khan could either be a part of the new order that replaced him or be swept aside in its wake. The Khan merely smiled in retort a cold smile, imperious in its contempt. He would not countenance a new emperor, neither himself nor his brother. Jagatai explained, that the reason neither one of them would ever rule the galaxy is that both of them were never the empire builders. They were the outriders. Mortarion had chafed at this role, while the Khan had embraced it. Enrich, Mortarion backed away, silence crackled into life, sparking with green-tinged energy. The Death Shroud lowered their sights, 
in a combat posture. Behind the Khan, the Kashi raided their blades. The Khan prepared to settle their argument, once and for all. The two Primarchs circled one another, prepared to finally engage in a deadly duel that would decide one another's fate speed against implicability. An interesting contest. Though the Khan was blindingly fast, Mortarion's raw strength was phenomenal. Facing it full on, Jagatai doubted that any of his brothers, save perhaps Ferris Manus, could have matched it. The Death Lord absorbed every strike that connected, sucking the power out of the Khan's blows like a leech, taking the hits and coming back for more. The tenacity of the Death Guard was legendary, as was their ability to absorb punishment and just keep coming. The Silent Death Shroud were just as implacable as their master, as they fought the White Scars Kashyyyk amidst the wreckage. Warriors of both sides had already fallen, their bodies caked in the drifting dust, but the fighting continued around them, bitter and unyielding. As the Primarchs continued to fight, the Khan actually felt himself begin to tire. Never in uncounted years of combat, had he felt more than trivial stirrings of fatigue. He had never felt the bone-deep drag that Mortarion inspired. But the Khan knew that his brother suffered as well blood flecked his sallow cheeks and forehead, and his rebreather rattled as he halted in thick breaths. Mortarion barreled into the Khan, using his side like a halberd and smashing the hilt into the Khan's midriff. The Khan lurched away, stumbling, and Mortarion lumbered after him. More blows came in hard, heavy, earth-shaking blows. The Khan was driven further, only barely able to weather the explosion of fury directed at him. When they slammed together again, the impact was bone-jarring. They tore into one another, each strike powered by raw defiance. Fragments of armor flew like shrapnel. Gas exploded from Mortarion's store of vials as the glass shattered, nearly blinding them both. Blood flew in straggling splatters, trailing across both combatants and staining their armor. As they hacked and countered, neither giving up so much as a centimeter of ground, it mingled upon the blade's edges, as rich and dark as wine. Summoning up one last burst of energy, the con held position, panting heart, trying to drag up energy for the final clash. He held his dial poised, waiting for his enemy to move. One trust, one perfect trust, angled precisely, he had the strength for that. But Mortarion did not move. He stood, rigid, as though suddenly listening for something. His sigh fell into guard. A thin coughing broke from his mast, which the con realized was an exhausted kind of chortle. So the choice has been made. Mortarion informed Jagatai that their respective storeships were at war. This was not what they had been promised by the White Scars Warrior Lodge brothers, but the Death Lord refused to lose a fleet for this fight. Feeling the dust stir around his feet, Coils of marsh green teleportation energy rippled down. He saluted the con mockingly, and spears of hard edged light suddenly lanced down from above, bursting through the cloud cover and crashing through the heart of the ruined Tisca pyramid they had been fighting within. The con sprang forward, seeing too late what was happening. In an instant, the Death Lord and his retinue were snatched away sucked into the vortex of the warp. The world's wind howled in their empty wake, the ash stirred, the lightning forked. Jagatai, carried by the momentum of his final trust, staggered though the empty space where his enemy had been. Chin Xa faced him, unblooded, but for his blades. The Thousand Suns legionary was still there, as were five of his Kashyyyk. The con was enraged the hunt had not been concluded, the kill had been ripped away. Chin Xe lowered his weapons. For a moment he said nothing, 
but faint clicks from his helm gave away the attempt he was making to contact the White Scar's warships in orbit. The Khan turned to Alvida and ordered him to get him off of Prospero. Alvida warned them that it would be difficult. He could only manage the use of his powers for a short while and hoped that someone would be watching carefully. Collecting himself, Alvida summoned silvery witch light from his hands, the light blazing so intently that it was hard to look at. Then, he extended his hands heavenwards and released a column of coruscating luminescence, electric white and searing hot. It shot out vertically, leaping up and bursting into the skies above. The con looked upwards, over to where Alvida's release energy still shot into the turbulent skies, and hoped someone saw their signal. Caught up in the maelstrom of the two opposing factions of White Scars aboard the bridge of their Legion's flagship, Sherban Khan had to make a decision fight and most likely die alongside his brothers or listen to the pleas of a mortal woman. The young Khan's first reaction was to shove her aside and get to the enemy. But the desperation in her eyes stopped him. Sherban glanced at the teleportation platform and then looked back at the pleading grey-haired woman in the tattered Imperial Army uniform. Coming to a decision, he quickly scooped her up in his arms and sprinted towards the teleportation mechanism as fast as he could. As he ran across the bridge he was shot multiple times by stray bolt rounds. He kept going, gritting his teeth through the agony. As the platform's columns rose above them, he pushed the mortal clear before his falling body could crush her. The woman crawled free, darting into the relative safety of the chamber's inner mechanisms. As small bolts exploded against the circlet of columns, she frantically punched in a series of coats, and the apparatus began to hum with building power. A second later, the space between Sherban and the mortal woman exploded with light. A heart bang shot out, radiating across the entire bridge. For a moment, no one could see anything within the seething mass of energy. Then figures clarified within it white scars in Terminator armor and a space marine legionary in red armor on his knees from exhaustion. Before them stood a greater silhouette, massive in ornate armor, his cloak shredded to ribbons, his face an armored mask of burns and heavy cuts. Jagatai strode out of the failing storm of light and cast a baleful gaze across the bridge. The hall was still in torment, with battle brothers at each other's throats, lost in a maddened world of battle cries and muzzle flares. The con strode down from the platform, his kashik following him closely. Ahead of him, the command hall remained, swamped in combat. Many of those close enough to the teleportation flare to hear it over the clamor of the fighting broke off in sudden confusion, but others remained committed, locked in the storm of bolt shells that crisscrossed the entire space. Witnessing in that terrible moment warriors of his own legion at each other's throats, Mortarian's words rang in his head, as mocking as his final salute, half your legion has already declared for Horus. He scanned over to the command throne, where the fighting was heaviest. With a lurch of recognition, he saw Heisek Noenkon occupying the dais, fighting hard to repel a surge from Jamulan's warriors. The Khan's battered body carried him to the heart of the storm. His dao felt heavy in his grasp, still slick with Mortarian's blood. The Koshi came with him, forming a protective cordon around their premarch. As he swept through the heart of it, some of the fighting broke down. Warriors looked up from their duels, seeing the ravaged armor of their premarch again as he strode up to the throne, as if realizing only then the depths to which they had sunk in his absence. The echoing cacophony of bolter fire abetted. Heisei was waiting for him. The bridge fell silent. Warriors remained in position, their weapons still poised. 
every eye was fixed upon the commandes. The con asked the knowing con what madness he had unleashed. Hasek replied that what he had done was for the good of the White Scars Legion. The con coolly noted that Hasek had been aware that he would return when he launched his coup. Or did he also plan to keep the Kogan away until the fleet was secure in his hands? The Noankon replied that he had only wished for his Primarch and Horus to be reunited once more. That was his only hope. That the whispers of the Faithless could not be allowed to prevail. The Khan was incredulous at this statement. How could Hasek call those who opposed him Faithless, when it was he who had caused such madness and betrayed his Primarch? Hasek admitted that mistakes had been made, but nonetheless, he and his warrior lodge brothers saw the truth. The war master had called, and the white scars must follow, for that had always been the way. The con informed Hasek that they had all been lied to by Horus. As the Noin con tried to explain the reasons for his actions, the con roared in anger at his commander's treachery. As he did so, he raised his blade. Perhaps unconsciously, perhaps without meaning to, or perhaps through some misguided belief that his cause lent him the power to do so, Hasek lifted his own in response. The con pounced, sweeping his dull heart and locking edges with Hasek's tall wall. With a twist, he wrenched the sword from the Noin con's gauntlet, then switched back and plunged the dull's point deep into Hasek's midriff. The strike was aimed with perfect precision, lancing through the Terminator battle plate with a hard crack of disruptor field discharge. Hasek went rigid, impaled just below his hearts, unable to respond as searing energies rippled across his body and locked him in paralysis. Slowly, grindingly, Jagger Tycon hefted Hasek off the ground one-handed, pulling him upwards until their faces were level. His blade kept Hasek in position, bearing his full weight and preventing him from responding. With every ounce of his post-human strength, the Khan reached for Hasek's helm with his free hand and wrenched it from his head, casting it to the ground in contempt. For a moment, they stared into one another's eyes, one face white with shock, the other rigid with anger. The Khan told Hasek, that he knew nothing of the truth. If he had done, as commanded, Jagatai would be telling him of it now. Instead, he would only tell him this the fifth legion was the order of Jagatai, and none bore their blades in it save by his word. Thus it had been since they first fought together on the Altec, and no power of the universe, be it Horus or the Emperor, would ever change that. The Noyankon had been given freedom that no other lord of a space marine legion would countenance. But this was how Hasek repaid the Khan with betrayal and fire, and so the impertinent warrior would be struck down for his hubris. The Khan flung Hasek's body aside. It flew free of the great power blade and crashed into the warship's command throne, cracking it lengthways, before rolling down the steps of the dais. Chin Xai strode over to him, his own weapons drawn, but Hasek did not get up. Turning away, rage still pulsed through the Khan's veins, laced with the heavy grief of betrayal. For an instant his mind was filled with visions of lashing out further, of bringing punishment down on the entirety of his errant gene progeny like some vengeful god of the forgotten past. But in the end, his eyes were drawn up to the observation arch, out through the enormous rearview portals, towards Prospero's orbital space. Far out into the void, silent bursts of light flashed out. Mortarion had spoken the truth about that, at least warships had engaged, lances were being fired, shields were buckling. There was no time. A reckoning would come, the con cried, addressing the hundreds who waited for guidance. But for now, battle called. He ordered the crew to vox the rest of the White Scar's fleet. They would engage the Death Guard, 
Guangzhou Formation, Full Burn. Outnumbered and outgunned, the Death Guard Formation quickly fell back into a defensive cordon. The White Scars went after them, hearing, strafing, hurling all their pent-up fury in a maelstrom of lance energy. The Second Battle of Prospero did not match the horror of the first, for the Death Guard had come to hopefully oversee the incorporation of an ally, not embark upon a protracted void conflict. The two fleets grappled together as they pulled away from Prospero, locked in a web of broadsides and attack runs. Under Mortarian's leadership, the smaller 11 5th Legion forces rallied enough to withdraw from the system intact, but they could match neither the speed nor the firepower of the reunited White Scars. The battle moved steadily out of the system until Mortarion finally gave the order to disengage and make for the Mandeville jump points. Leaving a trail of fire and plasma in their wake, the Death Guard entered the warp, abandoning local space to the control of Jagatai Khan. With the enemy driven from Prospero, the 5th Legion halted its pursuit. The fleet mustered once more, holding position in loose formation, just as it had done at Condex. Some ships still ran with dissension, and the process of restoring order was neither quick nor without violence. The Con visited every battleship in person, stamping out the last traces of rebellion where he found them. Blood had been shed on many vessels, and some had been commandeered entirely by White Scar's Warrior Lodge members, still hoping to sway the Legion to the cause of Horus. Some took their own lives rather than endure the shame of surrender, though most recognized the authority of the Kogan and offered up their blades in contrition. A few smaller vessels never made it to the muster, either destroyed by the Death Guard during the engagement or disappearing quietly presumed unwilling to accept the rejection of their planned accord with the traitors. The seeds planted by the lodge were set deep, and not all of their groves were capable of being removed. The wounded Heisek Noi and Khan remained on the sword storm throughout the engagement. Only when Mortarion had been banished did Chin Xe come for him, removing his weapons and armor and escorting him to the confinement chambers. Heisek did not resist. His face gave away the soul of a man destroyed. Others went with him into confinement, among them Gogol, Hibu and Togan Khan. There they awaited judgment, guarded by the Kogan's own retinue. No precedent existed in the Fifth Legion for their actions, though under the old law of the Altec steps on Kogaris, the crime of treachery and betrayal had only one punishment death. The Thousand Sons Astatis Alvida remained with the White Scars Legion and was given quarters on board the Sword Storm. His health had been ravaged by the long sojourn on a dying world, and it took solar days for him to recover enough to speak of what he had seen. The Storm Seer, Yosujia Tagatia, had fought his way halfway across the galaxy aboard the frigate Sickle Moon in order to reunite with the Khan, and both the Zadian Aga and Alvida spent many hours together after that, though what they discussed was not revealed to any but the Khan. It was known Yusuja asked after the fate of his friend Ozak Oriman, whom he had hoped to see again, but Alvida could give him no guidance. The Stormseer was forced to conclude that either Oriman had been killed by the Space Wolves or had escaped into the warp along with his master Magnus. In either case it seemed most likely that they would never meet again. Of the many links that had once existed between the White Scars and the Thousand Suns, only Alvida remained. As for the Khan himself, once the violence of restoration had ebbed, he retreated to his chambers on the flagship and took counsel on the Legion's next move. Only Chin Xe and Yusujia stayed with him during that time, though it was known that a Kuraltai, a summit of the Legion's cons, would be convened to purge any remaining bad blood. It became quickly evident 
that the Warrior Lodge faction of the 5th Legion had not truly understood what they had been working towards, for the horrors they venerated no longer existed. The knowledge gleaned from Magnus needed to be propagated swiftly, ending the long period of uncertainty that had blighted the White Scars Legion. Such was the way of the old plains, grievances would be hurt, penance would be meted, bonds restored. No time was set for the gathering, but all the Brotherhood cons knew it would be soon. Now that the true shape of the treachery against the Imperium was known, it would not be long before the Brotherhoods were ordered to war, unified once more and thirsting for vengeance. Until then, there was nothing to do but prepare, restore, and hope that the wounds of the Legion would heal before they faced the traitors once more. As Alvida spent his time recovering from his ordeal on Prospero, he befriended the Stormseer Tagatai Yusujia. As the Thousand Suns slowly regained his strength and precognitive powers, Yusujia repeatedly attempted to convince Alvida to become a member of the V Legion, since the Thousand Suns were now considered excommunicate traitories by the Imperium. He even went so far as to commission his legion's artificers to create a hybrid pauldron, incorporating the iconography of both legions, to replace the one of Alvidas that had been severely damaged during the fighting against the Death Guard. Though Alvida seriously contemplated becoming a part of a legion once more, he eventually refused he would remain, always and forever, a son of Magnus and a loyal servant of the Emperor. Alvida was determined to follow his fate, for he believed that his destiny was somehow connected to the image of the raven associated with the Covid cult sigil that he had foreseen while he was stranded on Prospero. During this time, Alvida had also begun to experience the mutational effects of his legion's gene curse, known as the flesh change. Nearly four Terran years later, the White Scars had successfully waged a guerrilla war against the traitor's supply lines deep in the void. Though their attacks were devastating initially, over time, the White Scars' numbers were slowly being whittled down to near-critical levels. Following a particularly devastating ambush by the Iron Warriors at Illevuin, the Kogan was determined to make his way to the Imperial Throne World, to stand by the Emperor's side when the Warmaster and the traitors would inevitably invade the Soul System and lay siege to terror. But they were hindered at every turn, trapped by the Ruin Storm, the massive Warp Storm conjured by the word bearers, Traitor Legion, during the Kulf atrocity that blocked off large portions of the Milky Way galaxy to both interstellar travel and communications. They were also constantly being stalked and harangued by traitor ships from a combined traitor task force comprised of both the Death Guard and the Emperor's children, led by Lord Commander Eidolon himself. An opportunity soon presented itself when the White Scars discovered the Calium Gate, an ancient warp gate that dated back to the Dark Age of Technology and had long been abandoned since the Age of Strife. Unfortunately, the White Scars were not able to make use of this warp gate as their tactics and patterns had become predictable to the traitors and Lord Commander Eidolon correctly deduced that the White Scars would attempt to utilize the Calium Gate to reach terror. By the time the White Scars arrived, they found the Warp Gate was in ruins and that it was teeming with the forces of the enemy. A vicious battle ensued between the two opposing forces. In the ensuing conflict, it appeared that the Kogan had been mortally wounded when he faced the much-changed Lord Commander in battle. But this was merely a feint, as it was actually Kashyyyk Master Chin Xe wearing the Kogan's armor. Fleeing their attackers, Aboard the White Scar's flagship Lance of Heaven, Chin Xe would eventually succumb to his wounds. During this time, Alvida could barely hold back the ravages of the Thousand Suns' mutational flesh change, and each time he utilized his innate psychic abilities, his genetic curse threatened to overwhelm him completely. 
But before his friend Chin Xi died, he told Alvido to do everything in his power to find a cure for the flesh change. Alvido vowed that he would. It was later revealed that the white scar's presence at the Calium Gate was merely another diversion, as they had no intention of utilizing the Warp Gate for the Kogan's true purpose was to find a notorious senior navigator, Novator Peter Eccleus. Once Novator Eccleus had been found, he led the White Scars to the Catalyst Warp Rift, where hidden amongst its turbulent warp eddies was a long, crystalline void station. Within its edifice was an ancient and powerful device known as the Dark Glass, a relic architect device from the Age of Technology. Discovered early on by rogue traders during the Great Crusade as they opened up new regions of the galaxy for the Imperium, this device was believed to have been used in ancient times to test the technology that would later result in the construction of the Golden Throne. The Dark Glass, like its counterpart on Terra, could access the webway through the use of a central throne controlled by a cycle of enormous power to operate. Still pursued by the forces of the Death Guard and the Emperor's children, the White Scars discovered the location of the Dark Glass and intended to use it to instantaneously travel to the Soul System. However, a rogue agent of the novice Nobelite named Vale, who had accompanied the White Scars, was secretly tasked with the destruction of this archaic device, for it could spell the end of the novice Nobelite if the technology was widely disseminated across the Imperium. Tagatai Yusugai led a small strike force onto the crystalline space station, desperate to make use of the dark glass. With the enemy closing in, and the station collapsing all around him due to explosions of vortex charges set by Vale, Stormseer Yusugai sacrificed himself by inserting himself into the Dark Glass Command Throne and then opened a portal through the webway to Terra, which allowed the White Scar's fleet to swiftly flee through and escape the traitor's clutches. Before he died, Yusugai's astral form imparted a final message for his friend Alvida he asked him to utilize his vast psychic abilities to guide the White Scar's fleet to the throne world. As the White Scar's fleet passed through the Immaterium, it was assaulted by hordes of demons. After he managed to guide the White Scar's fleet closer to Terra, Alvida finally succumbed to the effects of the flesh change and was rendered unconscious. Call it Hossen, captain of the Imperial Armies, fourth clandestine altar, and an agent of Melkador the Sigilite, the region of Terra, arrived aboard the lands of heaven. He promised the White Scars that his master would do everything in his power to treat Alvida's condition, for the Sigilite had long been awaiting his arrival at Terra. In an attempt to save Alvida's life, he was transformed in an arcane ritual conducted by Melkador, the Sigilite, into an amalgam of Alvida's own psyche and a psychic fragment of the personality of the Primarch Magnus the Red, which had been left on the throne world after his ritual incursion into the Imperial extension of the Webway. The new hybrid, being chose to call himself Aeneas, later known to history as Janus, who would go on after the heresy to become the first supreme Grand Master of the Grey Knights. It is known in Imperial records that much of the White Scar's legion, including its Primarch, was present to defend the Imperial Palace during the climactic Siege of Terror alongside the Blood Angels and Imperial Fists legions. Such was the ferocity of the attack by the forces of chaos that the besiegers forced the Imperial defenders back to the walls of the Imperial Palace, where thousands died, slowing the assault. When the beleaguered forces faced a breach and potential collapse of the Imperial defenses, Jagatai decided on a change of plan. Rather than assaulting the almost invincible flanks of the Chaos Army, he redirected his highly mobile Ordu and the surviving Loyalist tank divisions of the Imperial Army to the Lion's Gate spaceport. At dawn, Jagatai's lightning raid caught the traitor garrison at the spaceport completely by surprise and reclaimed the spaceport for the Emperor. 
The Khan ordered his troops to reactivate the spaceport's defense lasers to prevent the traitor fleet from bringing down any more troops and equipment and form a defensive perimeter to hold their newly reconquered territory. Khan's troops repelled several frenzied counterattacks from the traitors and began firing on Horus' unprotected dropships. The Khan's plan worked perfectly. The flow of the traitors' men and machines to the Imperial Palace had been cut in half at a single stroke. Inspired by this success, the Loyalists also tried to seize the Eternity War spaceport, but were driven back by the Chaos forces without difficulty, as they had reinforced their garrison following the loss of the Lion's Gate. History recorded little else of the Great Khan's actions during the Battle of Terror, but it is known that his legion ranged the once proud thoroughfares of Terror during the campaign, engaging the traitors in punishing hit and run strikes. When the end finally came, when Horus died at the hands of the Emperor aboard his battle barge, Vengeful Spirit, in orbit above mankind's homeworld, the white scars emerged from the fires of galactic civil war bloodied, but alive. It was said that Jagatai and his warriors fought many of the Chaos Space Marines that tried to retreat to Terra's spaceports and flee. The White Scars launched several highly successful hit-and-run assaults against the traitor forces and together with remnants of the Imperial Army's 1st Terran Tank Division and several infantry regiments, they successfully harassed the enemy supply lines as the Chaos Armies fled to the Eternity Wall spaceport to get off-world and escape Imperial vengeance. The White Scars Legion must surely have been at the forefront of the legions that pursued the defeated traitors to the Eye of Terror during the Great Scouring, for the White Scars rarely allowed a defeated foe to sleep away once their blood was up. Seven Terran years after the end of the Horus Heresy, during the period called the Time of Rebirth the Imperium was largely guided by the Ultramarines Primarch and Lord Commander of the Imperium Robot Gilliman, the White Scars adopted Gilliman's Codex Astartes, and the Fifth Legion allowed itself to be grudgingly divided into several different successor chapters. In order to contain the outlaws, renegades and aliens that dwelt within the warp rift called the Maelstrom that had taken advantage of the disruptions of the Horus Heresy to run amok in the Ultima Segmentum, Robot Gilliman ordered the surrounding star systems to be reinforced. The White Scars were tasked with the main responsibility of securing the Yasen sector the star systems that surrounded their homeworld. According to the writings about the Great Khan found in the White Scars Fortress Monastery of Guangzhou, the White Scars learned upon their return to Kogaris, following the end of the heresy that their homeworld and its people had been the target of numerous raids by the Drukhuri to seize thousands of Kogorians slaves. Jagatai swore many oaths against the Drukhuri because of this crime and fought them in many battles until peace had largely been restored amongst the imperial worlds that were adjacent to the Maelstrom. Jagatai fought alongside his white scars for another 70 standard years following the end of the Horus Heresy, eventually disappearing in 084.m31 when he travelled into the Maelstrom. Jagatai is believed to have been in pursuit of the Drukhuri, who had savaged Kogaris, following the Battle of Carousel V, with his first brotherhood, when he went through a warp gate into the Drukhuri portion of the webway, ultimately vanishing forever. Jagatai had been in pursuit of a mighty Drukhuri lord, likely the Archon of the Cable that had attacked Carousel V and perhaps even Kogaris itself. None can say what befell the Primarch if he was lost in the warp or if he was slain or captured at the hands of an alien warlord, but the White Scars believe he still hunts across the galaxy and beyond in pursuit of his greatest foes. The White Scars believe the Khan is still alive somewhere within the webway and will one day return to the chapter in a time of great need. As a result of their Primarch's disappearance, the White Scars 
hold a particularly savage grudge against the Drukhari and will gladly seek out any opportunity to make war upon those sadistic aliens. The White Scars thus continue to fight in Jagatai's name, destroying the enemies of the Emperor in preparation for the day when the Great Khan completes his consummate hunt and returns to once again lead his chosen warriors and begin the next great crusade to unify the galaxy. YouTube is still new to us and we have much more growth to make so that we can continue to spread the imperial truth. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel for more tales of imperial legends. Your subscription will be noted as a sign of your loyalty. Join us next week for this and stay faithful to our God Emperor. Guard the gates for the holiness of the Emperor.